Next conversation we want to have is the situation in a country not so far from our, from where we are. And Kenya has been involved in trying to resolve the conflict that has erupted in that country. And this is in Sudan. We are joined by a political economy, peace building and development practitioner, Johar Tel Kamal Kanu. Hey, I got it. <laughs> I did. Well done. Huh? We're not going to ask you to say it again. I can say it again. <laughs> Johar Tel Kamal. <laughs> that is one name. Johar Tel Kamal. Mm -hmm. Kanu. Kanu we can say any day. Mm -hmm. We know Kanu very well. <laughs> Welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me this morning. It's good to have you here. Our colleague Siti Muga is not in. Um, he'd have loved to have this conversation, but um, uh, he will be here tomorrow. He usually gives us a proverb every day. Mm. So every week he goes into one African country and uh, he mines proverbs from that country. Every day he brings a different proverb. He sent me the proverb and the job that a guest has on the hot seat is first to listen to the proverb and then give us your interpretation of that proverb. I hope it's not in Swahili. It is in English. Okay. <laughs> the proverbs from this, for this week are from the country called Senegal. It's been in the news recently, right? Mm -hmm. After an election, a new president, youngest elected president in Africa, a opposition chief who was also incarcerated, and uh, his boss has now been appointed as prime minister in the country. But the proverb, it says, if the dog is not at home, he barks not. If the dog is not at home, he barks not. Johar, what's your interpretation of this proverb? Hmm. If if the guardian is taken away, then 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 he cannot chase you. Mm hmm. Hmm. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you go into a homestead that has no dog, it will not bark. Yeah. If the dog has left. Then you're free to get in. Yeah. It's one way of actually looking at Very it. Very interesting. Yeah. Other interpretations have been looking at the dog itself mm. and what the dog is doing wherever it's gone when mm -hmm. it's not at home. Now you've brought in a new perspective, which is so the dog in this home is absent. Mm. So there's nothing barking to stop you from coming into this home. Into this mm -hmm. home. Yeah. That's a good one. What made mm. you think of it that way? Is it is it because of you know your own experiences in life and what's happening now in your home country i think th there is that there's also my culture whereby like dogs are mostly to guard houses mm. Mm. so yeah this is this is what they're kept for mostly mm. so if they're not there then that that level of 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 guardianship is not there mm. yeah that's true that's a good one thank you very much mm -hmm. so i asked you before we went on air when was the last time you were in sudan and you said that was in april was it april march last year april april 2023 exactly a year ago yes there's been a conflict in that country that's been going on for all this time mm -hmm. what's your history with sudan how long have you lived in sudan i was actually born and raised in sudan mm. um it's true that when the war started, I was living in Khartoum, the capital, but I was born in another part of the country, the western part. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were moving around because of my father's work. So I can, I can, I can proudly say that I've lived in all parts of Sudan, mm -hmm. and I've visited all parts of Sudan. So the country holds a very special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. But why did you leave? Did you leave because of this conflict? I, or left, because of I left because of the war. I left two weeks after the war. This is when I fled the country because where I li used to live is very close by to where the clashes were, mm. were very heavy and so on. So I left Khartoum, I went to another state, then another state, and then we crossed the border and we ended up in Kenya. Mm. This war erupted one, was it a Sunday morning, if I remember? It was correctly. a Saturday morning. It was a Saturday morning, yeah. right? Just things just went haywire. Mm. Take us through the motions of that day it's and true, maybe yeah. weeks prior it's true that the war just started on a sunday morning but even before that we could see that it was building up um as, as some of the listeners might know um few years ago sudan had a very big revolution it was revolution that fu was fueled by youth by women it was 
participated in by most of the social um, categories, it was it was one of the most beautiful things that happened to the country because it showed us what civilians can do, what can that they can bring about change peacefully. And this revolution, of course, has ended up the regime of Bashir, the the famous Bashir regime, mm -hmm. uh, which lasted for 30 years. Um, and after that, we were going through a transitional period, which was very pompy, to be honest. Um, of course, in any transition, uh, you would find different political parties, you would find different political groups, you would even find the army trying to, to find the way of power sharing throughout the period in order to reach elections and so on. And in Sudan, that wasn't easy, because 30 years of, of an autocratic regime is not easy. Mm -hmm. um, political parties were not able to... Um, to practice politics uh, openly, uh, people, even even a political people, were not able to express their opinions, and and different parts of the society were just not able to express. So once we had that open space, we didn't necessarily, um, we weren't necessarily able to come about and 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 and, and overcome our differences and so on and, and and come up with a structure. So the way that the transitional period was governed was through what we call a constitutional document, which was mainly naming a partnership between the civilian faction. Um, that that, that was led uh, that was leading the revolution and mm. the military faction which is mainly the army the national security and the rapid support forces which has risen to the media recently but mm. yeah it was the two groups sharing power at the time mm. and of course military has different priorities and civilians have different priorities and they don't necessarily meet all the time especially in a country like Sudan that has a long history of wars a long history of um, um, militarization and so on and so forth mm. so the transitional period wasn't going very smoothly um, um, in 2021 we had the coup um, on that constitutional document and this coup was staged by the armies um, rapid support forces and some civilian factions that that moved to that side mm. um, this coup has 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 ended the term of the um, um, prime minister at the time the dr abdullah hamdok mm. um, and then the country was just in a series of protests where young people were protesting the coup were protesting the abruption of democracy and so on and so forth and then this led up to, to the, to the build of the war because after the coup has happened, the coup camp itself was fractioning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even the military side was now thinking how can they uh, divide the reefs amongst themselves. Mm. And this is where the issue started to rise to the, to the mm. surface, where the army and the RSF, uh, the rapid support forces, they started to, uh, to appear as competitors rather than people on one camp and so on. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And that also then silenced the civilian side, right? Why did the civilian side of this revolution go quiet i think i think they were silenced it wasn't it wasn't an option because because you know the issue of security is, is always a priority mm. when you talk about security people think that's a priority in in face of other things mm. so now when when you're talking about two war in generals people think about stopping these two war in journals. They don't think about, you know, inclusiveness of civilians. They don't think about representations. They don't think about, you know, hearing the grassroots voices and so on. I think this is what's been happening. But I would say in defense of the civilian camp in Sudan that has been working very hard over the past few years, they've been trying. But also in face of the military machine, it's not easy to have a, a higher a higher voice in face of the people holding the arms and so on. But the civilians have been trying. And, um, and I take very high pride in the civilian movement in Sudan, the grassroots mobilization, mm -hmm. um, even the political elite, even though we, we criticize them a lot, but they've been trying. But in face of the arm, it's not, it's not, it's not that easy to have a higher voice. Okay. Yeah. What was the sound, what was the message of the civilian uprising um, at the time um, from this side of the world, from look anywhere outside of Sudan, it was very clearly heard Bashir must go. But what was the message that the people in the uprising were actually trying to put it out? It was actually three words mm. freedom, peace, and justice. Mm. These were the, the words that were chanted on the streets, were written on the walls, they mm. were even posted on social media peace, justice, and freedom. Mm -hmm. These were the demands of the people. And then when you go through them, it pretty much covers everything. Mm -hmm. We wanted peace because many parts of Sudan have been going through war for many years. Mm. We wanted freedom from the regime that was uh, capturing the country. And we wanted um, um, justice for all the crimes that have been done on the Sudanese people for all these years. So these were the demands, and there still are the demands, even until now. Because now what's happening is that we're just adding more criminals to that list yeah. that, that need to be uh, prosecuted. Mm -hmm. um. But then, Johar, if you look at that uprising, the civilian uprising, with these three words, these are strong, they were rising against a military regime that had been there for decades all right so those holding power were the military side of government but then the people 
by through mobilization from villages and all and pouring onto the streets were loud enough to actually force the military side to do something about it but then it just died too too fast in my opinion that loud voice of saying so we want we want freedom we want freedom we want justice for all the atrocities committed we want peace and the route to that is a democratic election and then the democratic election does not happen and then the voice of the people starts fading mm -hmm. it faded too fast i think um just just to start uh, start with i wouldn't say it has faded completely mm -hmm. up in like up until the month where the war started just before the months where the war started there were still protests on the street mm. it wasn't just getting enough attention as it used to be before this okay. is the first point the second point i think because because i i did some work on non-violent action and, and non-violent movements and so on mm. it's a bit natural for non-violent movements to fade out eventually because mm. because these are popular risings yeah. these are they depend on mobilizations they depend on people's attention and people have different things to do in their life mm. i cannot guarantee that you know a million people would march the street every day mm. but what happens for you to transform this into actions you have to be strategic about your goals yeah. and you have to network with other groups you you have to network with demand groups that are dedicated for this you have to network with political parties mm. you have to network with different factions of government in the country or governance in the country mm. but if it's just a popular mobilization that's having some very nice slogans yeah. that march on the street every day it's it's for a fact that's not going to go anywhere if if it just ends there it cannot so, be sustained exactly so it's not just sudan i think mm. it's a trend that we see in different parts of the world where if a revolution is not followed up with a strategic action then yeah. it doesn't go anywhere but then we have seen those like just like you said we've seen those lessons from elsewhere in fact we we're having that conversation here when the uprising was happening and we kept saying we just hope this doesn't go like the arab spring mm. we saw people pouring onto the streets during the arab spring and then such revolutions are usually taken over usurped by others with interests and the interest of the people who are coming out into the streets, who are spending sleepless nights mobilizing, who are shouting and screaming and saying we want to change, are not realized. What is it that, that, that you know, why, why don't we learn these lessons as we get into a new popular uprising? everywhere i think I, I agree that lessons were not learned but mm. i think it's not just on the sudanese people i think it's like a sauce where it has yeah. different ingredients mm. the people can do their part mm -hmm. the government has to do its part the neighboring countries have to do some part and even the international community for example as people were marching on the streets they were they were some 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 brutal suppression of this protest yeah. Yeah. we didn't hear so much on the international media about it mm. people weren't aware that people were being shot on the street as they were peacefully protesting mm. uh, no one was echoing that sound saying you know this this brutal suppression or this brutal oppression of protest of peaceful people needs to stop uh there was no i would say civil society to civil society solidarity in the region mm. there were so many missing elements that when you look at it you would say it would just die eventually because you can't just survive on your own you can't just make this sauce with one ingredient i guess hmm. so present day um and the events leading to present day which for example saw you and probably, not probably, but most assuredly, many other people leave Sudan mm. for whatever reason. Uh, fear of life, or rather fear, fear for life, mm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. What now led to you leaving, to thousands of other people leaving, and what's the present situation? Millions, actually. It's mm. almost two million people that right. have crossed the borders mm. from Sudan at the moment. Mm. Uh, so, basically, as you said, it's fear for life. Mm. Uh, for example, as I said, my area was in direct shelling. So there was there was no heavy place where you, there was no safe place where you could you could go to and have a safe haven there. Mm. This is the first thing. And now people continue to leave. So so I think because there are different obstacles to live in the country, people choose the safest and the most attainable options. The first option is, of course, to go to a safer area yeah. because the war was not in all the states. Yeah. Our seal is not in all the states. But as you move, for example, you move from Khartoum to the nearest state, which mm -hmm. was Yazira state, um, it was it was becoming very expensive to even live in these areas mm. because you know at wartime you find so much inflated prices mm. you find so many brokering happening uh, people are not ab able to afford this housing they're not they're even the even the services are overloaded like the hospitalization and so on and so forth so people find themselves moving as they go ahead. Yep. like you go to the first 
place where you you displaced you find it not as convenient as you thought it would be yeah, and then the you continue step. moving mm. and then for some people that had the means they decide to cross the border but mm. even that it has its own its own uh, challenges mm. having the papers speaking the language of the country where you're going just just having the courage to go to a new place and yep. start start a new life and so on so um you asked me about about the different things why people are leaving um and there is also oppression because now for 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 civic actors they cannot they cannot they can they even target it with lists like in certain areas some of the some some of the warring parties would just come with the list asking for this person and that person who are known to be active who are activists and so on and ask for them so people just leave for fear of persecution and so mm. on mm. there's two warring factions now both armed what is the actual dispute power <laughs> i would say it's power because this in the build up for the war there were conversations about security sector reform where people were talking of course the, the rapid support forces started as a militia it was then formalized by the parliament and then the state started treating it as a as a as an official um, as an official force um uh, though the people did <laughs> never recognize it as an official force oh, and then the people they, didn't mm. the people didn't the people they didn't because because as because a militia as a militia because we know the history of this militia in Darfur and in different parts of the country as it was used as a weapon against against the citizens and so on and then there is the state army which is in itself of course it's the national army but in itself it's been highly criticized by the people especially during the revolution and so on mm. so so th- there were different things that they were disputing against but mainly it was this this integration where they were saying in two years time the rsf would be integrated in the army or in 10 years times the rsf would be integrated in the army of course it's each faction had their own interest in this timeline mm. and it it meant that they would have to divide so much economic groups because the two the two groups have massive economic empires in the country mm. the army has huge military industrial complexes mm-hmm. the rsf has very notorious gold industry mm. uh, where they've been exporting the gold from sudan selling it outside and getting the money for themselves and so on in addition to so many mercenary activities like you know sending soldiers across the border to 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 fight for people and get money for it mm. so it was mainly power then economic kind of um gains mm. and uh, in, in addition of course like just just ruling the country and and, and yeah having control over everything mm. it sounds like those are two things that it would be very very difficult for them to agree yeah yeah because because yeah dividing this 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 because the army controls a lot of a lot of economic activity in the country and so is rsf mm. so it's not something that you would give up easily okay yeah. so bring in igad bring in the african union bring in the international community even those across the red sea all of them could see that these two guys were going to clash at some point what did they do in my opinion they didn't do much and mm. I, and I, and i have an I, I and i think there is a reason for that because all these institutions that you were talking about they have their own internal contradictions even if it's a regional block mm. this regional block is composed of countries that some of them are neighboring to sudan some of them are not neighboring to sudan but they have interests with some of the parties so when they sit on a table and they decide on what to be done with sudan they think about the interest they don't think about the interest of the average citizen that's suffering that's hungry and so on mm. i mean it might be coming as a priority but at a later stage so the first thing is always the interest of the different groups this is why you find these competing platforms um this is why there is this forum shopping whereby you know today there is negotiations in jeddah tomorrow it's in manama the other day it's in god knows where and so mm. on and so forth mm. yeah okay so as we look at a situation today where i mean would we s- i mean looking at conflict looking at f- full on war what would characterize the situation in sudan today there is a huge humanitarian crisis in sudan as a moment people say it's the biggest humanitarian crisis in the world currently where 25 people 20, 25 million people according to un agencies are in need of aid mm. where 3.7 children are malnourished where um a 20 million people are internally displaced and mind you sudan is is 40 million people so yeah. that's half of the population mm. and so many children are dying of malnourishment so many people are struggling even across the border in idp camps and so on education have been stopped for a year now no no child has been going to education in sudan mm. to school at all for a whole year now even in safer areas because even the schools in safer areas are being used as 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 um as shelter houses um the health system of course in the war areas is completely out of control khartoum i think umdurman town in khartoum has only one function in hospital and mm. and that's a place that's hosting around 2 to 3 million people it's a lot yeah mm. um 
uh, and even in safer areas, there is very high load on this health services, whereby the initial people that are there are going to these places and the people that are displaced are also going to that places. And of course, there are new fatalities and new injuries because of the war and so, mm. so on and so forth. In addition to that, which worries me the most is the huge militarization and recruitment, because as the war continues, What's happening is that average citizens feel the need to protect themselves by yep. themselves, yeah. sure. whereby there is a huge arms trade being, being, being expanded in the country. Mm. Um, so many people are taking benefit of the situation where they're selling arms to, to civilians. Um, people are training to protect themselves. Even You see even young children trying to carry up arms in order to protect themselves and their families and so on. And in my opinion, this is one of the things that are going to be very difficult to be reversed in the near future. Our guest this morning is... Uh, let me take a pause and then I can read the name. Jora Telkamal Kanu. She is a political economy and development practitioner from Sudan, born and raised in Sudan, left Sudan last year when war broke out in that country. And it's been one year since and the situation is not getting better. Like you've just heard, half of the population is, inter is displaced. Many children, no. All children are not mm. going to school. All schools closed. Many people are not uh, able to access health services that are just the basics, food, shelter. 25 million people in need of urgent aid. What is the international community doing about it? So, Jora, you're telling us about 2 million people have left the country since the outbreak of this particular conflict. Where have they gone to? Um, different places depending on... Um on different options you had and uh, as I said earlier the different abilities those who are um, who have uh, passports and you know um, official papers and visas to places of course they went to these places mm. um, at the beginning because all, all, all airports were not working people had to cross land borders to neighboring countries and they fly from there now we have one function in airport where people can fly out um, people that didn't have the ability or that privilege they went to to the nearest option. For example, most of the people in Darfur, they're displaced into Chad. Most of the people in the southern parts of Sudan, they're displaced into South Sudan. Mm -hmm. Most of the people in the northern part and in Khartoum, they've moved towards Egypt. And I'll, I'll come back to that. And of mm -hmm. course, some people, um, uh, a few people maybe went to Ethiopia and Eritrea and so on. But the difficult situation is the entry to these places. Mm -hmm. For example, Chad and South Sudan, um, they, they don't require visas to enter mm -hmm. uh, for, 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 for Sudanese people, at least for Sudanese refugees fleeing mm -hmm. the war. Even though the situation is not ideal across the border in these camps, but still available for people to just flee across the border and go. Mm -hmm. uh, for Egypt, for example, uh, before the war, Sudan and Egypt have what we call the Four Freedoms Agreement, mm -hmm. whereby people, Sudanese and Egyptians could move freely across the border. And for Sudanese, it was women, it was men over 50, and children below 15. Mm -hmm. So it was a wide range of people that could go to Egypt without visas and so on. Surprisingly, a few months into the war, mm. Egypt has, has unilaterally stopped that, mm. that agreement. And now every Sudanese person is required to get what they call um, a security permission to enter Egypt. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's expensive. And What's the process of application for this? You go to the consulate, you apply, you wait. Some, I know some people have been waiting for months to get into, into mm. Egypt at mm. the moment. Mm. Um, so it's, it's a very long, tedious process. And it's also expensive because so many brokers are working into that yeah. at the moment. So it's becoming up to $2,300 to just get that permission, okay. which is, of course, not so many people can afford it. Mm. I mean, very few people mm. can 2000? afford it. 2000 2000 US dollars? Yes, exactly. Wow. That's from one end. Additionally, from, 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 other, from other countries' sites, mm. there are so many other countries in the region that are welcoming, but, but they have the regular visa process. For example, for you to apply as a Sudanese person to apply for an online visa, it's not a valid option because, first of all, before the war, we had sanctions whereby I think 99.9% .9 of the people didn't have online payment mm. cards. So even for you to apply for a visa to Kenya, to Ethiopia, to Uganda is not that feasible. Yeah. You have to know someone that has a visa card that can pay for you and apply for you so that you enter this country legally. Mm. So even though it, it seems to be easy, but, but, but when you look at the situation of the Sudanese people, it's not that affordable. Not to mention all the financial restrictions, um, other restrictions related to culture and, and language, because of course a person would prefer to go to a place where at least they speak the language. Yep. And that's not the option with all the, all mm. the um, neighboring countries. 
one more thing that I want to highlight is that before the war, Sudan was a big host for a lot of refugees. I think it's the biggest, second biggest host in the region after Uganda. Mm. And with the war, of course, these refugees were already vulnerable, and now they're extremely more vulnerable. Um, we had so many South Sudanese refugees. We had so many Ethiopian, Eritrean, even Syrian refugees that were hosted in Sudan. And after the war, they found themselves in a situation whereby they can't go back to their initial yeah. countries, and they can't remain in Sudan. Mm -hmm. So they're somewhat stuck where they cannot find any 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 exit and so on so a even that estimate of how many uh it was around one million one million something refugees in sudan this this was official stats but i'm sure it was more than this mm. since we have many borders we, we share many borders with mm. many countries okay i've not heard you mention uh the gulf countries in the middle east are there people who've crossed into these countries yeah, 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 because historically so many Sudanese people were expatriates in these countries. Some of these countries have, have provided some, 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 um, some methods whereby you can bring your family members, you can add them to your visa and these kind of things. But of course, that's, that's not available for everyone. It's not cheap mm. to do this process and it's not cheap to even take your family to that place. So yeah, even the countries that offer these options, it's not, it's not for everyone. Mm. Okay. So here we are. How the... You see, in, in, a, in a position of conflict, obviously, those who flee a country because of, of the war at the time are not necessarily thinking about the future at that moment. Usually it's the preservation of life at that time to remain alive. But what do you see? What is it that people at some point would want a peaceful Sudan where they would now then be able to return to and fight for those three things or rather see the establishment of those three issues that you, that you mentioned We've seen um, areas of conflict, of war previously, where people who have fled want to start a new life where they have gone to and don't want to come back to um, what a, a warring situation then has, pre has, pre has presented. What do you think is the area or what is the general sentiment now? Are people giving the opportunity to this conflict to live out the length of it? and come back home or people are done i think i think that's a good question from my personal interactions with many people and even with my own family members i think if if i'm not mistaken every sudanese person wants to go back mm -hmm. for different reasons first of all because especially for young people because they think this is a country that we've been fighting for for years now we can't just let go like that mm -hmm. and if we weren't forced we would leave because for so many people they had the opportunity to just leave the country before they didn't mm. this is from one end the second thing is that um it's just not easy in the new places where people have moved to mm. it's not easy to be integrated into these new communities to start a new life so you would rather just go back to an area where you know and there have been stories about people that have went back even in Khartoum as it's been you know raging with, with war mm. people still would want to go back and live in that area that they're familiar with and try and make a living in, in under the shilling and so on and so forth so so this is the general sentiment so far people want to go back and so far people are counting the days where it's just an option for them to go back there. Uh, most of the people, even if they want to make a living and start a life, it's just to sustain mm -hmm. rather than the long, the long term. But I, I don't know, as the, long, as the war prolongs, I think it it's just wouldn't be an option. You just find yourself immersed into this new life where you just have to, mm -hmm. have to survive. So what's the status of the people who were in these other countries? Those that have left Sudan as refugees, and they're in different countries. They're in Kenya, such as yourself. There are those who are many who are in South Sudan, in Egypt, uh, in Chad. What's their status? So the biggest host countries for, for Sudanese refugees at the moment are Chad, Egypt, and South Sudan. And in all these three countries, the situations of the refugees are very dire. For example, in Chad, people that have fled there are fleeing from Darfur, where the situation has been extremely violent. Mm. These people have left with nothing. They have no resources whatsoever. They are in IDP, IDP camps, where aid is very, is very short. Aid, aid is at shortage, where people cannot even get enough aid in, this, in these camps. Mm. Um, the situation in Egypt is quite similar. Because of the difficulty to enter the country, so many people have resorted to illegal ways to enter the country. So we've been seeing a rise in smuggling trade for people from Sudan to Egypt, whereby, of course, you pay, you pay a lot of money to go into the country and then once you're there you don't have the official papers so you either live in the dark or try and, and neutralize your situation by going to 
to UN agencies and try and get IDP cars and so on. South Sudan, of course, most of the returnees are people that were refugees from South Sudan in, in Sudan. Mm. They, of course, vulnerable. They had to go back into very difficult situations. And same thing for Sudanese. And of course, South Sudan has its own in, internal issues whereby it's not necessarily able to, to host all these people. And as I said, agencies are saying that they don't have enough aid to, to cater for all these amounts of people and mm. so on. Mm. So what's the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees doing? They're, they, as, as you said, they, they say they're doing things, <laughs> but in reality, um, they say that they're short of funds, they're, they're, they're unable to sustain all the funding needed and so on and so forth. So last year, there were um, different um, announcements that aid is short in some areas, even with 70% shortage, uh, where they cannot support people inside and outside of Sudan and so on. And I think in, the, in this case, it's not necessarily the agency's fault. It's just the, the failure of the international community as, mm -hmm. a, as a whole. Mm -hmm. We've seen cases where um, whenever there is a global issue, the international community just changes its attention to that particular issue and leaves the other one. Uh, Sudan, unfortunately, and, and, and it's just so sad to say this, we have to compete for attention with other crises. Yep. Uh, like, for example, at the beginning, it was the Ukraine war, and then there was the Gaza war. Even though I acknowledge how bad these situations are, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's, it's, just, it's just not fair for, for a country to compete for, for who has the worst crisis in order to get mm. more aid and more attention and so on. Right. Is there any form of support for these refugees that's coming from the African Union? Um, not that I'm aware of. I know that the UN agencies are the lead intervener in, right. in these different areas, yes, but, yes. Right. but I don't think the African Union has direct humanitarian support at the moment. So what it's only doing is only dealing with the political situation. Yes, exactly. Trying to resolve the political yeah, situation. Yeah. From your own assessment, how is that doing? How are they doing on that? I think it's not going well because we're still in war, <laughs> aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think, I think the African Union and the, and the Union in general still has much more to do. Uh, and I hope to see some progress in the in the coming month at least. Um, at the beginning, it was mainly um, at least the attempt to broker peace was led by countries from outside the region. It wasn't necessarily led by the by the region. And when the region was coming in, it was more of a dividing factor rather than than a unifying factor. So I hope to see that changing in the next few months. Well, indeed, what would be. I mean, from what we see, usually we, are, we already know what the narrative is that has been created from two conflicting parties. And unfortunately, the country suffers. We know this. What would be for that pendulum to swing in the, in the way now that everybody would be happy? that would bring about ceasefire, that would bring about peace. We need leverage. Uh, so far, I haven't seen leverage on any of the two warring parties. Because mm. as I mentioned at the beginning, is that all these countries around us and all these groups, they have interest. And interests usually go both ways. So these interests have, are not being leveraged in a way whereby these people are forced in a table to sign an agreement that they abide by. So because of that, um, because, of, because of lack of this leverage of, of, and, and this pressure, we don't see that, that commitment yet. And I think this is where the international community feels is that so, so far they're not able to give up some of their interests in order to bring these people together and put the interests of the Sudanese people first. Do you think there's interference from some of these countries, like direct interference, direct support of factions, one and the other, in the countries that are currently being seen to be taking some move or some steps towards pacifying Sudan? They've been, they've been, they've been official reports about interference of the United Arab Emirates, for example, mm -hmm. supporting the rapid support forces um, through Chad. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the two countries have denied these allegations, but it's been issued with, in reports, and even Sudan has issued their official uh, memo at the, at the UN Security Council about UAE's um, interference in the, in the current war. So this is, for example, one, one, one direct apparent um, interference. Mm -hmm. There are other linkages that might not be as clear, but they're just natural. For example, Sudan and Egypt, of course, we had a very long history of relations. So it's only natural that Egypt would see a particular side and then aim to support that side. Same thing for Ethiopia. So these are same thing for South Sudan and Chad. So all the neighboring countries of Sudan, of course, they have historical ties with different parts of the warring parties and they would want to sustain these, these relations. Mm. Mm. The general of the army was not happy with Kenya and our president playing a part in this conflict. Why? So at the beginning, I think it was about the way the narrative was shaped. The army does not accept being equated with the militia. 
even though it's the army that established the militia, but mm. you know, mm. <laughs> today they, they don't accept. So mm. the treatment of, of the two generals, of the two warring as parties equals. as equals mm. is something offending for the army as an official state institution. Mm. So I think this is where, where things have been, have been a bit messed up, at least from the army situation. Mm. Was it resolved? I, I think it's, it's been frozen at the moment. I haven't seen any statements recently. But but I don't I haven't seen like any exchange of statements mm. in the recent times. I, I don't I don't think it's fully resolved, but it's frozen. Is that the very least a desire to have a conversation? Is that the very least to have both sides come to the table to have a discussion? Because even without the desire to say, okay, well, let's see the possibility of us talking, then it's very difficult for you to see how you can broker any kind of peace. And I think that there can be external parties that. Oftentimes we'll say, well, let's do this, but that's not a situation that you can force. I don't know of a conflict on the planet that has been broken into a situation of peace without the desire from both sides as an element for that menu. Yeah. I don't think there's ever been one on earth. Yeah, yeah. So is there at the very least something to say, okay, well, we don't like this either, but... This is what is going to have to happen in order for us to... Is there at least that desire? Yeah, I think that's the unfortunate situation, is that that's, that desire is not yet uh, uh, mature. It's, mm. not, it's not fully ripe yet, because it's been fluctuating. For example, when RSF makes an advance, advancement on the ground, they don't want to negotiate. Mm. When the army makes an advancement, they don't want to negotiate, because they feel they have the bigger arm and so on. The bigger hand, at least, the upper hand. Um, so eventually, it depends on how they, how they see their situation or the military advancements on the ground, and they, then they decide if they want to negotiate at the moment. Even though officially they would say, okay, now we're willing to sit down and talk and so on, but mm. in reality, it, they're, not, they're not acting upon it. But the other worry is, is again, something that I've mentioned earlier, is the extreme recruitment by civilians, is that now, even if the two warring parties, the official armies, mm. sit down on a table, you have so many citizens that have arms that are not part of these two two groups that that you know they don't want to stop now because you know my 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 brother was killed my sister was raped my village was burned why do you want me to sign a peace deal so mm. the longer this prolongs um and at the same time I, I see sudan as a link between north africa and the horn of africa between sahelian africa and the horn of africa again so it's it's at the crossroads of the different parts of africa hence it can be a major trade route between these different regions and so on mm. this is for for one example and mm. of course just like many African countries, Sudan has massive fertile land, it has so many minerals, it has so many animal resources, and before the war, Sudan was exporting a lot of its own uh, produce to different places, and most of this has been um, reduced significantly after the war and so on. So this, this economic value comes from Sudan's location, um, and yeah, it, it, and its own resources. Just natural that, resources. Natural mm-hmm. resources that are not, at, are, are not being utilized at the moment. Okay. Let's get a bit controversial and, and, and ask... Could there be international interests in these economic resources that could then fuel the conflict to remain as it is? I, I don't think it's a good question. I think it's an is <laughs> question because I think it's happening at the moment that different countries have different economic interests in the country. For example, the Red Sea, the Red Sea port, of course, is an interest for many countries. So many people want to have ports on the sea. So many people want to have military bases on the sea, so many countries and so on. So, of course, that's been active even before the war. There were different negotiations with different countries about who's to have a military base on the Red Sea and so on. Mm-hmm. Same thing for, for other resources. Sudan gold is being smart to other countries and it's being sold to other countries to fuel other wars in other places and so on. Um, same thing for, for fertile land and so on. So it's an active, it's an active kind of um, quest for resources. It's not something that, that might happen um, to, f- to sustain the war, if I, if I understood your question correctly. Mm. Where do you see the solution coming from? Normally, I would say the solution comes from the people because it's, it's the people that, that would decide what they want. But we also need support. We need serious, committed international and regional support that puts the benefit of the average citizen first. Mm. And then, and then, and then we, I think we could, we, could, we could move ahead from there. In what shape would this support come? Support, for example, to the civilian people that are trying to mobilize, to okay. the civilian people that are trying to help people on the ground. By what? By fundraising for them? By, by fundraising, by providing or? platforms, by providing access to different donors, by these by this different means, and mm. by advocacy, by, by telling people. Because I, I, 
I, I'm, I'm saying this because even when I was Sudan, I wouldn't know about the details of what's happening as a country by just telling people like today what's happening because I assume that not everyone who's listening today knows the full story of Sudan. Yeah. So telling people, mobilizing in different places and so on. It has happened before when, when the, uh, the arrest warrant was issued against Bashir a few years ago, people mm-hmm. in different countries were, were mobilizing and Kenya played a big role in that. Mm-hmm. There was a warrant, arrest, um, there was a warrant issued for, for against Bashir yeah. in this very country. So I think if if we just open up the space, open up platforms, there's a lot to be done. Hmm. Do you think, I mean, it's, I think there's speculation and I think there's also that feeling that everybody knows what's going on without actually saying what's going on. But if, you, if, if there was no external involvement in what's currently going on in Sudan, do you think that there will be an organic development of Sudan's own people out of conflict? There is a possibility, but I'm afraid it would take a while. Mm. Because in conflict, your your first priority is to save your life. Mm. And that comes before everything else. Like, I would be thinking about saving my personal life before thinking of solving the whole situation of everyone. And, and then as we build up that momentum, it might take a while. And I'm, and I'm afraid that <laughs> in this while, we will lose a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We see how the world is, is handling other ongoing crises right now, right? If you look at the crisis in the West, we see Ukraine, and there's a lot of attention being given to it at the UN uh, level, at uh, the big countries, the US dedicating resources into this, in the European countries dedicating resources into this. Look at uh, the situation between uh, Israel and Gaza and the whole focus and attention going into this. Why do you think Sudan is not getting this kind of attention? I think power plays a different role. And I think there is a mistake that maybe the situation in Ukraine can spill over to other European countries, for example, or maybe because the Israel-Palestine conflict is a long-standing conflict that have, of course, is different global camps and so on. Mm-hmm. But the mistake that the people are making here is that underestimating the crisis in Sudan. Mm-hmm. Because if Sudan continues to fail, then it's a failure for the whole region. Yeah. For example, all the tribal... All the, re- all the border tribes in Sudan are shared with different countries. So if this part of the tribe in Sudan does, is suffering, it would probably spill over to the other part that's in Chad, to the other part that's in Ethiopia, to the other parts that, in, uh, that are in South Sudan. So Sudan is not going to fail alone. That's, that's the biggest, that's the worst scenario is that as we fo- fail down, we're going to be pulling other countries into this, into this hole as well. And I think this is what people are underestimating at the moment. Mm. Is the failure of Sudan because this is to survive then based on what you're saying an indictment on the other countries in the region exactly this is why other countries need to act fast because you don't you don't want to be pulled down into this conflict it's it's in no it's, it's in no one's benefit to have the second the third largest country in africa <laughs> fail in the region it's it's a very big country to fail mm. yeah would power sharing be an option? Do you see the two generals actually sitting at a table and agreeing on any form of political power sharing? It's an option, but it's not the most pleasant option for civilians. Because at the end of the day, you're just repeating the cycle where you're just giving men with arms more power. Mm. Where, where do we see the, the path to democracy? Where do we see a path to representation? Where do we see a path to fair, uh, just representation of people and so on so it's an option but is it the ideal option definitely not paint for me the picture of the johar ideal option from this conflict to a peaceful sudan it's ideal a as roadmap, <laughs> yes. yeah, ideal. ideal option it's it's uh, the, it would be whereby there is a permanent ceasefire between the two warring parties where it can peacefully enter the country where the country is being handed to a civilian faction for the transitional period until a fair and just election takes place okay Ideal, practical option. Oh, the, no, this is where compromise happens. <laughs> yes. This is where compromise happens. It depends on where you stand and what you, and, and what you're looking for. For some people, they think just a peace deal as a moment we do because, as they say, civilians have been failing the country for a while by not upping their game, by not um, yeah, by not doing by not doing the things they should be doing. For some people, they think it should should still be fully civilian, even if they have their own force, because at the end of the day, it is civilians and it's it's people that we can talk to and so on. So I think the practical side would just lay somewhere in the middle, depending on who's willing to compromise what. Hmm. Do you see the possibility soon? I hope so, and I pray for it. (laughs) It's what the people would like to see. Yeah. Yeah. So as we stand right now, there is no functioning government in Sudan. 
There is a government. The army thinks there is a government that's functioning. Functioning? Because here, we remember the things that you said to us. There is one hospital operating in Sudan. Children have not been in school for a year. Roads are impassable. Markets don't function. Is there a functioning government in Sudan? Um, there are there are institutions that are partially working in certain areas of Sudan. The majority of the country is in the dark, where there is no access to services. And what's even worse is that areas that are being controlled by RSF, they're establishing their own civilian governments. So it's a situation whereby there are two governing institutions. In safer areas, which is mostly in the east and northern parts of Sudan, um, it's the government of Sudan that's running things, and areas where RSF is in control, their field officers and, and some of the civilians are running things. So it's two, two countries in one, if I may say. Mm. So currently, what's a civilian elite and civil society doing? Um, the ones that were very, very vocal, mm -hmm. and they forced Omar al-Bashir out of power. What are they currently doing? So the things that has happened after forcing Omar al-Bashir out of power is that these civilians were dividing among themselves mm. for different because it's a big political spectrum in Sudan, from the far right to the far left and so on. So these people, what they've been trying to do is to try and bring everyone together, at least under the minimum agendas that they can agree on, in order to form a front against this military side of the, of the government. So these have been the attempts since the beginning of the war, to have a big platform of civilians whereby they can lead negotiations, they can sit on negotiating tables and so on. But of course, these are being highly criticized for being an elite um, civil society, as you mentioned, that they're not fully representative of the people, that they're not connecting to the people on the ground, they're just looking for their own political interest and their own regional interest and so on. But I hope to see this change in the future because because at the end of the day, it's, the hope would just be a civilian, a unified, logical civilian front. Are there, are there like leading lights? People, you know, in various conflicts, you know, there are various names that are mentioned. That even if, if we went to transition, for example, you'd have so and so and so and so, you know, a group of five or ten that take up leadership. There are there are there are people that are taking leadership. Unfortunately it's the same people that were taking leadership in the transitional period. So I'm yet to see new faces that bring new hope to the Sudanese people. Because one of the reasons why the civilian front is being criticized at the moment is that it's somewhat recycled faces from the previous period that want to have another opportunity to govern. Mm. Why did that fail? Mm -hmm. why, why were people so pissed off with that transition? I think because, because you, you get disappointed at things that you have high hopes at. I, I mean, I'm personally not highly disappointed in the military arm of the government. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, we've been, we've been used to it. You didn't expect much from them. Yeah, I didn't expect much. But for civilians, it's the people that we march on the streets with. It's the people that we delegate. It's the people that we, we could talk to, unlike in previous governments. So when you see that fail... Your expectations, because they were very high, you would just yeah. be highly disappointed. Yeah, mm -hmm. disappointment also is as high. Now speak to the people who are listening and who are going to watch this conversation later, right? What is it that you'd like them to know about what's what happening in Sudan and do? So the biggest worry at the moment is the looming famine. As I, as I keep saying, people are hungry in Sudan, just to put it to put it out there. People are hungry, children are, di are dying out of hunger, and it's going to get worse because, as, as I said, Sudan has very... Uh, big fertile land which we're not able to to cultivate at the moment people who manage to 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 seed they're not able to harvest and so they're automatically getting hungry aid is not uh, the limited aid that's there is not allowed into the country because the two warring parties are not allowing allowing smooth delivery of aid and 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 people just don't have access to these inflated food prices and so on so keep talking about sudan um keep an eye on the famine uh, push towards more support mm. to the to the people that are hungry at the moment. Push towards more support for regional advocacy, and um, yeah, keep talking about Sudan and, and and don't make it a forgotten crisis. Stand mm. with the people of Sudan. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, Jora Telkmal Kanu, thank you very much for joining us today. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.